growing up, uh, I used to you know, mainly listen to my parents' records. I suppose that was what was you know, lying around. They had a kind of weird collection of uh, classical records and some strange spoken word records. Mum had a few Beatles records, so that was kind of cool. Um, but I remember being like, obsessed with Thriller uh, by Michael Jackson. Um, except I think when, when the video was on TV and I'd sort of hide behind the sofa and kind of get a bit freaked out. I grew up with uh, three brothers, um, so I, I, I sort of absorbed everything that they were they were listening to, kind of you know, pumping out of their bedrooms, which tended to be a lot of Smiths and The Cure and, and things like that, and and then later a lot of um, a lot of Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, and Spiral Carpets. So it was kind of a bit of an indie house, really, you know. And um, yeah, it wasn't until I was about eleven or twelve, and, and music really kind of got a hold of me, and then. Uh, I came back to the Beatles and you know, kind of been introduced earlier on with my with my mum's records and, and just became uh, just completely obsessed with them. I, I bought every album there was to buy. I had posters all over my walls. I bought every book. I even started trying to write a book about them. Um, I remember going to my dad's office and, and trying to paste sort of pictures together and, and 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 kind of you know rehash bits that I'd read into this sort of new book about them. You know, thinking I kind of had any any authority on that, but. You know, growing up with, you know, in the time I was growing up, it was sort of the late eighties, early nineties. Um, you know, when I was really getting into music, and that was, the, I mean, to be honest, there wasn't a, a load of great music being offered around the UK. You know, arguably. Um, so I spent that time sort of just just listening to the Beatles and then kind of the Stones and ABBA and stuff like that. But uh, it was strange at that from that point. I kind of. The stuff I would listen to would kind of move through the decades, you know, as I got older, you know. The Stones led on to The Who and, and Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and and then from that kind of like, you know, Neil Young and, and Stevie Wonder as well, loads of great soul music and, and things like that. And then, it, you know, again kind of moved on through the through the sort of 80s and, you know, back to The Smiths and The Cure and, and, and Stone Roses and these kind of as a clash had a big impact on me as well. Um, uh, and, and then, like I say, you know, we, we've, we've kind of arrived in Britpop, and things kind of, you know, the, the sort of scene that was out kind of met up with with uh, with what I was listening to and what I was into. I think the first ever contemporary record I ever bought was uh, Paul Weller's Stanley Road, um, which you know again had quite a big impact on me. And that, you know, since then, just kind of dipping in and out of some really cool bands and, and artists, and um, you know, things like Arcade Fire and. and uh, Raconteurs I really like, uh, The Shins, The Bees, um, Midlake, you know, some, some, some great bands over the last sort of 10 years. Um, but at the moment, um, you know, listening to a lot of 70s Beach Boys, you know, uh, I've kind of re re been re-listening to um, uh, LA Woman by The Doors, which I love at the moment. And um, got this uh, fascination with uh, Claude Debussy, he's kind of a more, bit more kind of classical uh, sort of pianist, composer. But um, really, just so relaxing. It's got this amazing kind of, you know, calm, sort of calming effect on me. Um, really, it helped a lot, sort of, with the music I'm writing at the moment as well, with this, this sort of, you know, the vibe that he kind of puts out. So yeah, really into that. Yeah, I think I started my first, my first band at school, uh, like you know, like a lot of people did, I suppose. You know, friends from around Oxford as well, you know, which is where I grew up. And, um, you know, kind of sort of dipped in and out for a few years and sort of tried to find my feet a little bit of playing gigs. I think my first ever show was at a, I think it was a church hall. Uh, I think we played three tracks. And one of them was uh, Jimi Hendrix All Along the Watchtower, the, the Hendrix version. And that was, um, you know, that was my first ever experience of a live show. So that's kind of, it was kind of dodgy, but, you know, good memory anyway. But yeah, things didn't sort of really get kind of really going for me until I, it was about 2003 when I joined uh, 2220s, who were a, a really cool uh, sort of blues indie band um, in the UK. And they'd kind of moved them, uh, made the move south, uh, pl playing a lot of shows in London and stuff, and they were looking for a keyboard player. So I, um, uh, I sort of got the call and, and kind of went along, and, and we just got on really well. And these guys are amazing musicians, really. Uh, Really cool guys, really funny. Uh, we used to um, we used to bond over uh, like Alan Partridge quotes and like, hidden Motown songs and things like that. So we had a lot of good fun on tour. 
And you know, we did some we did some big tours as well. You know, it was great. I was I think right at the start, I was just just thrown into uh, um, we did a, a massive tour in the U.S. sort of, sort of month long uh, with um, the Kings of Leon and Jet. That was a great time. I remember doing some some big stadium gigs in the U.K. Uh, with Oasis, and uh, that was that was just you know mad, you know, doing these these massive stadiums with, with Oasis. It was just you know sort of felt like the you know kind of pinnacle of what you could do live. So uh, and it was really weird. I remember uh, Liam being really nice to me backstage, which which is which is odd because I think he had a bit of a reputation for being uh, a little bit sort of difficult, you know. But um, after you know a few years playing with Twenty to Twenties, that kind of uh, you know. I think some time was taken out to spend on the on the second album, and things kind of sort of run its course in a way. And at that point, I, I started playing in Supergrass. Um, I started on just sort of taking over on keys now and again uh, um, at first, but then moved made the move to second guitar, um, backing up Gaz. Um, and you know, it was just crazy playing in Supergrass. I'd grown up with them, you know, Gaz and Rob, um, are, are my brothers, and. and Grown up with these guys, and, and when they were releasing their first album, recording their first album, I was in my first bands, and but it was it was great, uh, you know, it was great playing with them. I came in for the last last couple of records, and you know, we just had amazing times. We just had, to, you know, I'm really lucky and fortunate to be to be quite close, you know, got quite a close family, and, and be very close with my brothers. So, um, it, you know, it was. It was a special time. It, it really was. It was. It was some some amazing shows, amazing times backstage, and um, you know, and, and and with with Gaz especially, I think, uh, you know, I played with him recently on his uh, tours for his debut album, Here Come the Bombs, and uh, I mean, just just again, just an incredible time. The 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 band and the crew, um, just really special people. You know, really great great people. So funny. Uh, musicians are so talented, you know, playing with Loz and Joe and, and, and Growler. And I, I think after that amount of time playing with Gaz, you know, I've been playing for about sort of five, six years with him. And there's, a, there's like kind of five years difference uh, in our age, but I think uh, by that point you start to feel like we were sort of twins, you know, kind of weirdly in sync. So that was strange, but um, yeah, really just great, great sort of memories and, and you know, great tours and yeah. Just, just great. <laughs> yeah, I, I was uh, living in Brighton for about five years. Uh, amazing city, Brighton. Lovely. It's like being on a holiday all the time. You know, really lovely. Uh, but I made the move back to Oxford about 2009 and formed uh, Charlie Coombs and the New Breed with some, some brilliant guys from Oxford. Amazing musicians. Really funny guys. Uh, Jake and Dave and Rory and then later Rich as well on drums and Miggy, uh, Brazilian Dynamo uh, on drums as well. And kind of like Spinal Tap went through lots of drums. But um, really, you know, great time. We went into the studio with Gaz who helped us record uh, three EPs in sort of three consecutive years, Panic, Waves and Noise Control. Um, and uh, you know, especially with Gaz at the helm, they, they, you know, just something I was, I was really proud of. You know, I've uh, been writing for, for many years, you know, since I was about 11 years old, but never really felt that the stuff I was coming out with was, was kind of ready, you know, to, to, to get out there and, 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 and to make something off. So I, I just sort of been building up a stockpile of songs, and, and and by that time, I think you know, there was there was, you know, some tracks that I felt were really ready to get out there, and I was really proud of. Um, so yeah, it was a good time to go in and record those EPs and, 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 and do that, especially you know, especially recording with Gaz, that was great. And we were lucky enough to do some really cool tours, you know, we, we, we uh, did, the, did the UK and, and a few, few shows around Europe and, and we were really lucky to do a, a tour in the US, uh, which, was, which was amazing fun. I remember playing in, uh, in a casino in Vegas and, you know, just did, did a sort of little tour out there. And, I think one of the highlights was, was in LA, we played the Viper Room. And back in the Supergrass days, I'd met Dave Grohl, Taylor Hawkins from, from Foo Fighters and the other guy, the rest of the guys as well, and got on really well with them. And uh, we, were, we were playing this show in the Viper Room, gave them a call, and they came on down and, and, and joined us on stage. And 
and played some covers. I remember playing uh, "Stay with Me" by The Faces, and I think there were two drummers, and you know, it was just just chaos. But but um, you, you know, really really cool night. You know, great to see those guys again. And, and then we ended up doing uh, Supergrass's final shows as well. They put together a few shows across the UK and in Paris as well. And that was just, it was manic. I, I did, I remember doing um, like a full set with a new breed and taking about a 20 minute break. Then going back on stage again to do like an hour and a half of Supergrass. Um, so, you know, I think if it wasn't for copious amounts of vodka Red Bull, I probably would have been absolutely trashed by the first show. But, um, but luckily I managed to kind of hold it together and, and, and get through that tour, which was just, just crazy. But really special time, really you know, amazing memory, especially that last show in Paris. And then uh, we also did uh, Brazil uh, with the new breed. We came out in, in 2012. And I've already been out with uh, Supergrass a, a few years back to do a festival. Uh, but we went out just with the new breed and, and, and played a, a little tour, some beautiful cities in Brazil, um, with uh, a crazy but amazing rock band out here called Cachorro Clunge, which means Big Dog. And. Um, you know, these guys are nuts, they're absolutely crazy, but they have so much passion for what they do. I mean, more passion than about 100 bands put together. Um, really, really great guys. Um, but it was a really, you know, really great tour. And at that point, I think the new breed was sort of reaching its, you know, kind of reaching its end. It was just, just sort of going its natural course and we were interested in different things. and. That tour ended up being a really good way to kind of top it off, really. You know, uh, um, you know, really, really special way to end and uh, the new breed. It was about 2012, 2013, when I started to uh, write for sort of, you know, basically my first solo album. But that kind of got interrupted by uh, by by No Shelter. Um, I remember listening back to a lot of the things I've been recording and realised that I had, a, had a, an acoustic album kind of fully ready to go, it was about sort of 10 to 12 tracks. I went back in the studio with Gaz in 2013 and, and recorded No Shelter. And, um, you know, challenging album. It, it, my first instrument is piano, I've been playing since I was about six. But, uh, you know, writing a full album on guitar, which is like a second instrument for me, it was, it was you know, it was interesting, you know. it's. Uh, I think when you come out of your comfort zone and you, and you sort of, you know, you put yourself in that position, you end up, you end up sort of coming up with chords and structures and and things that you wouldn't normally think of. So it was, it was challenging but really rewarding at the same time. I made about, I made about six videos for for No Shelter. Uh, I think, you know, especially when you're a small artist, I think YouTube is a really important platform. I think it's. Uh, um, it's a good way to get your music across. I know lots of people who just go onto YouTube just to listen to the music, um, not necessarily even to watch videos. So I wanted to make sure a lot of the album was available and so sort of people could hear it. You know, um, so I made these kind of six videos. I think one I was most proud of was a video for a song called "The Last Drop," which featured um, NASA footage of a shuttle um, lifting off and going into orbit. And the footage was filmed by NASA, extremely high speed, extremely high frame rate. And then I sort of slowed, you know, it was slowed right down. So you could, you know, it was just sort of there to see in all its glory, really super slow motion. And these sparks flying everywhere and the smoke bellowing out. And it was just, you know, a haunting kind of image. And uh, I remember going, you know, sort of going through the right channels, uh, trying to, uh, to you know, make sure I had permission to use this, this amazing footage. And they got back to me one day and I picked up the phone and they said, uh, you have a call from NASA, please hold. And I just, I nearly fell over. It was just amazing, just, you know, oh, yeah, okay, just, yeah, all right. Um, so, but they were really supportive, you know, really kind of uh, supportive of the video and, and, and they said they liked the song and, and, uh, and the guy who was kind of responsible for the footage and, and stuff, I spoke to him. So I was really touched, I was really happy because I'm a big NASA buff as well, I'm a big NASA fan. Um, so that was, a, that, was a, that was a great day, um, but it's a video I'm really proud of, I think it really really kind of works with the music. But uh, right from the start, um, you know, No Shelter was, was a, a very kind of raw, very pure, very, 
you know, very kind of natural album. It's very close to the demos and, and recorded very quickly and sincerely and honestly. Uh, I think that was kind of part of the reason it was called No Shelter. Um, you know, it was it was kind of me sort of bearing my soul a little bit and you know, prodding at any wounds I had. And I didn't have a band to bounce up, uh, ideas off anymore. I was kind of you know just on my own to make decisions, which which was scary but liberating. So this kind of exposed sort of feeling, you know, led to led to these kind of very um, autobiographical, very introspective tracks. And I think that was kind of part of the reason why it was quite a soft release, you know, I, I think if you're going to put something out there that's so personal, um, you need a really big ego to back that up if you're going to really push it out there. So I was quite happy to to just sort of drop it out there and let the current take it and sort of see what happened. But um, it got a really good response, um, which I was really happy about.